Tame Impala took the world by storm with their debut record, Inner Speaker. Kevin Parker's nasally vocals were reminding listeners of the late John Lennon, and paired with the album's lush space rock melodies, what was intended to be something of an electronic album would be coined by many as a futuristic Beatles record. By their third album, Tame's sound had shifted dramatically. Feel like a brand new person. With more of an emphasis on synthesizers than guitars, Currents became an exploration into disco and R&B rhythms, and its more pop-focused sound wound up garnering the project legions of new fans. It's a transition that wouldn't be possible without their second album, Lonerism. Experimenting on new equipment, and with Kevin's growing interest in pop music, Lonerism sparked the sonic transformation from the guitar-based psych rock of Inner Speaker towards the electronic pop stylings of Currents. In celebration of the album's 10th anniversary, I thought I'd explore Lonerism's making, its significance in Tame Impala's discography, and how its themes of isolation made it the soundtrack of loners everywhere. When Inner Speaker was still days from its official release, Kevin Parker was already more excited about its follow-up. Touring alongside MGMT on their American tour made the 24-year-old frontman feel like a total outcast. Parties and the countless social situations he was put in while on the road reaffirmed his belief that he wasn't all that great with people. And I say reaffirmed because Kevin is a self-proclaimed introvert. Inner Speaker portrayed someone bathing in the glory of being alone. Kevin also prefers to craft his music alone, a technique that allows him to focus on single ideas. To Kevin, collaborating means having to compromise on those ideas, and he prefers having a singular vision, at least for his studio releases. Coming off the back of Inner Speaker, the frontman had found this new sense of creative freedom. I'd had this kind of like surge of confidence that I didn't have prior. When I made Inner Speaker, I was this kind of like shy, stoner. I had a lot of success the first album. We went on tours and all this kind of stuff. It kind of validated my approach and what I wanted to do. And so I had these kind of grandiose ideas and had the confidence to go through with them. With plenty of time to experiment and completely indulge, Kevin became totally immersed in his own musical world. Inner Speaker was recorded in a very official way, with a designated time period to record and an approaching deadline from the label. This next album, however, would be mostly recorded alone in his home studio in Perth, and with two years until his label was expecting anything new. My studio got its own full room for, for once. I like was using synths, organs, fucking anything. You know, I was that kind of typical uh, moment for a solo artist where they make their, uh, their self-indulgent opus. It really was that, looking back. like At that point, I kind of saw it as my pet sounds or, or, or whatever, you know. Todd Rundgren's 1973 album, A Wizard, A True Star, would be another influence on Kevin going into his next project. Rundgren's art pop record had him design his own studio so that he could freely indulge in sound experimentation. The two even share similar psychedelic sounds between one another. But that's After feeling like he had exhausted his love of experimenting with guitar sounds, Kevin wanted to experiment with new equipment. He would play with a vintage synth at a friend's house one day and found this whole unique world in a single key. He would soon purchase a Sequential Circuits Pro 1 synth on eBay and begin whipping up cosmic storms of his own. The album is a collection of psychedelic symphonies, where layers of new sounds are continually washing in and out of focus. While recording, Kevin would also become obsessed with pop melodies and the chord progressions of pop songs. He aimed to combine them with his explosive cosmic sounds, wanting to create something like Britney Spears singing with the flaming lips. The most pop-ready track on the album, Feels Like We Only Go Backwards, was supposedly inspired by dream pop band Beach House. I've traced it back. I think I was listening to this song by Beach House. It's called Walk in the Park. And it's funny because it's the same tempo and the same key and possibly even similar chords. That song had stopped and then I'd kind of just like, my brain had continued it on. Also, Tame's track uses the reversed form of a very common jazz progression. Intentional or not, the chords of the track are, in a way, going backwards, perfectly suiting the track's lyrics. 
Lonerism would also put an even larger emphasis on Tame Impala's drum sounds. I wanted to make something really kind of powerfully psychedelic. I'd gotten into the flaming lips and they had that kind of just like explosive, ecstatic, emotional, melancholic music. Suddenly I just wanted all my drums just to be completely blown out. You can see where, I, where at which point I went to Japan and saw Flaming Lips live and then went back and recorded Lonerism and the drums sounded like that. Like you can, you can, you can hear. Producer Dave Fridman helped produce a handful of the Flaming Lips records and would help Kevin with mixing inner speaker and lonerism. It was Fridman that would aid Kevin in achieving those massive, saturated sounding drums. When he wasn't at home recording, Kevin was recording ambient sounds in public with a dictaphone. You'll hear the ambient sounds of Kevin walking to his local beach in Perth on the album's closer. It's a window into a lonely wanderer's world. Much of lonerism is a peek into the mind of someone growing up and discovering their preference for being a loner. Crafting these new sounds were conjuring up emotions that Kevin hadn't felt since he was a teen. It led to what Kevin called a childish album, depicting the persona who turns into the one from Inner Speaker. The first thing you hear on lonerism sounds like a repeated self-affirmation, like someone with anxiety trying to pep talk themselves through overcoming a tough situation. At other moments, someone else appears to be comforting this introverted overthinker. You'll witness moments of frustration, where being a loner or feeling out of place in the world begins to impact one's relationships. But it's music to walk home by that Kevin calls the emotional core of the record. I mean, for me, that kind of like the centerpiece of the album. For me, it's the flagship of the album because it's just because it sums up the emotion of the album. The track reveals someone at odds with the introverted lifestyle they prefer and the social life their significant other encourages them to lead. It's the youthful dilemma of pretending to be someone else to fit in while still discovering who you're truly meant to be. These introspective feelings of solitude, paired with bombastic walls of sound, was something inspired by Supertramp. I had always loved Supertramp, like that kind of like stadium pop. Like I loved the idea of making a stadium pop thing, and I finally felt confident and able enough to do it. Kevin once said he gets a big buzz out of their music, because of how they pair introspective lyrics with an explosive sound, going deeper into oneself, yet expressing it outwardly and openly. <laughs> Elephant, one of Kevin's oldest songs and the album's garage rock anomaly, takes a slightly different perspective. It's how a loner might envision jocks and egotistical people. Or you could see it as an outcast's attempt at being more confident. But I think the album's melancholic sense of isolation is best exemplified in Why Won't They Talk To Me. The question in the chorus sounds like something you would read in a diary. It's deeply vulnerable. It's about the longing for connection and questioning why others avoid you or pay you such little attention. It's the notion that this isolation you're experiencing isn't by choice. And Kevin intentionally tries to make the listener feel that sense of isolation in Keep On Lying. The track features ambient recordings of people talking at a party, digitally manipulated and delayed. <laughs> It's meant to sound like a dinner party happening around you, where others are laughing and having a great time while you're left feeling alone in the crowd. <laughs> Lonerism would become an introverted escape for those that didn't feel like a part of the rest of the world. Kevin made the topic of social anxiety and isolation into something beautiful that helped others accept and deal with their own loneliness. It reflected on what it truly felt like to be an outcast, the frustration in pretending to be someone else, and the hope that one day, things would be different. Lonerism was kind of the first album where I um, 
started really kind of singing personally. I had found a new kind of guitar sound which led to me finding a new way of writing chords and these new chords were making me write music that was conjuring up emotions that I hadn't felt in a long time. It reminded me of being a child again basically. That age when I was like 14. I just started to become a teenager you know and like I didn't have the most solid family life to kind of fall back on there so I was tackling a lot of things on my own. I was just lost you know I just remember thinking like I've got no one. You know what I mean? This album kind of makes that all kind of like it had a purpose. Like it wasn't just, I wasn't just, you know, completely um, aimless and without hope. And that's the thing about Lonerism. When I, li- when I listened to it this morning, I was like, it's got this weird hopefulness to it. It does. It really does. Kevin would spend half of the album's making locked away in a little Paris apartment. While on a walk around the city, he captured the album's cover, an image of an exterior gate at Luxembourg Garden. I did know that I wanted the cover to be a picture of like a beautiful park with everyone in there and like having fun and being social but from the other side of the bars you know like that was that was kind of this idea I didn't know if it was going to work the image is meant to tie into the album's themes of isolation with the gate separating the viewer from the people in the garden also fun fact the album was initially called loner pop up until after it had been mastered and sent off for production the word lonerism would only pop into Kevin's head when CDs were already in production Kevin would immediately call his label and beg for it to be changed We did end up getting lonerism, but some of the first CD pressings are still embedded with the loner pop ID, making them somewhat of a collector's item. With the record completed, Kevin felt like an emptied out sack of an artist. He was only able to hear the album with a critical ear and couldn't imagine people would enjoy it. I would uh, I'd make the vocals louder. On Definitely. every track? Yeah, clearer. Even though I was really uh, inspired by um, singing about things I'd never sung before, by the time it came to mix them, I was, I'd return to my kind of shy self. I was like, no, bury him, bury him, bury him. I, I only want people to be able to understand it when they read the, the lyrics book. When Lonerism was released in October of 2012, it would exceed all of Kevin's expectations expectations and changes life massively. The album spawned several popular singles, propelling Tame Impala into larger venues and choice festival slots around the world. The album was nominated for Best Alternative Album at the Grammys and would go on to win Album of the Year, Best Rock Album, and Best Group at the 2013 ARIA Awards. Inner Speaker provided Kevin with the confidence to be more vulnerable in his songwriting and explorative in his production methods. The public's reaction to lonerism showed Kevin that he could trust himself to craft music of any kind. Not just psych rock jams, but stadium pop anthems too. It provided him with a new sense of purpose and motivated Current's deviation towards disco and R&B, a change Kevin knew would alienate some fans. Lonerism cemented the idea that Tame Impala was only a band in the live sense, with solely Kevin Parker behind its studio recordings. His decision to exert control in every aspect of production became an obsession. His following albums would possess even more of Kevin's heart and soul, his blood, sweat, and tears. Ten years later, and Lonerism still stands as one of the greatest records of the 2010s. To many, it's still considered Tame Impala's magnum opus. To the loners who grew up with it, it's a bittersweet reminder of a time long past. And for the loners of today, you might have just found some new music to walk home by. Listening to Tame Impala's music is a psychedelic experience in itself. But if you're looking for something to stimulate you visually, nature documentaries are usually the way to go. David Attenborough's Light on Earth, Out of the Cradle, Amazing Dino World, The Kingdom, all take you on a trip through other worlds. You can watch all of them and more in 4K on CuriosityStream. It's a streaming service that hosts thousands of documentaries and nonfiction content. They're the sponsor for this week's video, and they're offering you a discount on their service when you use the first link below. And when you sign up for CuriosityStream, you'll also get access to Nebula. If you're interested in watching these videos or others like it early and ad-free, as well as getting to see tons of great series from your favorite creators, you'll love Nebula. You'll also get exclusive access to shows like the Nebula Original Series Working Titles, where each episode dives into the opening sequences for movies, TV shows, and video games. If you sign up using the link below, you'll get 26% off. You get the package deal of Nebula and Curiosity Stream together for less than 15 bucks. You get access to two great services, but you'll also be supporting independent creators, which is always appreciated. So sign up today by clicking the link or by going to curiositystream.com forward slash middle eight. And that's it for me. Thanks for watching and keep listening.